Welcome to GM Tips. GM Rick here. I hope everybody is having a wonderful, wonderful day so far. And I uh, wanted to get a little bit into an interesting area of gaming, and that is focusing on Fae. Uh, Fae are a unique topic, <laughs> and I say Fae are. are. You can say the Fae is or the Fae are, because again, plural terms. Fae. So anything fairy, first world, um, nature, worldly aspect, nature's capricious side, however you want to term them. Mother's nature's children. The Fae are an interesting bunch. And what got me on the topic was looking at the Fae Revisited. And it goes through a couple type of Fae in here. It goes through, um, let's see. See if I can get them all onto camera for you. The Fae, the Dryad, the Nymph, the Gremlin, the Red Cap, the Leprechaun, the um, Kusalka, the Norn, the Satyr, the Knuckle Eve, and the Sprite. Um, Rusalka, I'm sorry, not Kusalka, Rusalka. There are so many more. There are Atomies, there are um, Bake, there are. Uh, Biloco, Boogeyman, Brownies, Buckon, Fawns, um, Darklings, um, Fularen, Fosgrim, um, Gremlins, Glastig. There, there are Griggs. There are so many different ones. The Fae have so many different aspects. It's almost like all the different races in the world of humanity. These are all the races of the realms of nature. Now, I'm going to go into a couple dis different aspects of the Fae because some people are very familiar with them. And again, some of you are going to run circles around me in this aspect. But the, I, the reason I do this is because if you want to do a campaign where you incorporate the Fae, I want to give you lots of creative ideas. So we'll call this video Creative Ideas on the Fae First World. And uh, uh, I love a lot of ideas when it comes to Fae. And so I read a lot of books especially fantasy, on these. One of my favorite, favorite series, and a couple of you have, um, that have me on Twitter have seen me talk about it, is the Dresden Files. I love Jim Butcher's uh, take of the Fae because it, it, he has the two Fae courts of the Sidhi. You've got the Winter Court and the Summer Court. And really, in most of the religions, and, and, and looking back into the mythology on Earth, the Fae was divided into the two courts, and, and it dealt with the seasons. You had the spring and summer, which were in one season, and the fall and winter, which were in another. And these were the two courts. And often these two courts were at war with each other because one wanted to be around longer than the other. They didn't want to hand over the reins to the other court. Now, we're going to look at a lot of different aspects of the Fae. So... If you have ideas, please, please, like always, post the ideas. The Fae can be an interesting realm to approach with your players, especially as a GM or a DM. No matter the genre, you could be doing something like the Dresden Files and an RPG. You could be doing a space opera type of game where they go to a world and run into a type of a Fae. You most mostly it's really useful in the fantasy realms, but you could use it in Deadlands. You could use it in Savage Worlds with um, um, uh, Solomon Kane and uh, so many other different game genres. You could use it in superheroes. You could use it in a Cthulhu-esque realm. There are all kinds of different places the Fae can pop up, and the Fae has always been around. and And that's the that's the that's the real supposition right there of, of this, is you have to suppose the Fae has always been and is always a part of whatever world your players are playing on. And that they have a huge vested interest in humanity and in the goings-on in that world. 
And so often they will come around, offer services, like to toy with the humans and the mortal beings, because to them they get bored. The Fae gets bored a lot. So as we look at that, we're going to look at a couple different things with them. Number one is the aspects of the courts. So let's take a look at the two courts. Who are the courts? You have the summer. And you have with it the the summer courts. So we're going to go through some of the historical um, fey courts and, and who are the rulers of the fey courts. I think in understanding that, that comes into a lot of underst better understanding of how people view the fey. Now, a lot of the fey came about due to the Sealy or unsealy courts. The Sealy court uh, travels through the plains, the Beastlands, Yisgard, Arborea, other places. And this court is made up of the different fey kings and queens, mostly queens in these things. So you have Queen Titania, and Queen Titania is part of the Sealy court, where the Mab is part of the Unseelie court. So you have Titania versus Map, and, and you have basically summer versus winter. And these two really work at odds most days of each other. Now, there are a lot of deities that are also referred to in the courts. So let me give you some of the different deities and mythology that goes along with them. Now, I hope I pronounce all these right, but I will try to do this. You have Kuivin, meaning kindly. And he is the deity of food and friendship in the Fey court. And basically he has the symbol of a tiny bowl and a pin. You have Dav, which means horned beast. He is more of a Korid that appears in the Sealy court, and he is the son of Titania and Oberon. Um, basically, the Korids, the Satyrs, the Atomies all work with Dav. You have Ectiern. Ectiern is a, un a, a white unicorn, and it is a deity. And he's the deity of unicorns and of the Pegasi and of all the hoofed fey creatures. You also have um, Emantianzian which is the god of the trees and the treants, and um, basically works with Titania in the, in the summer, but works really to make sure that the natural green order of things stays about in whatever kingdom. All right, now here comes the tough one. Fiengwala, which is the, the deity of the swan maze, so the swan fey creatures and, and the feathered creatures, that would be the realm of what these fall under. And it's a female god or goddess. Now you also have, <laughs> and I love these because they're all Celtic names, so please bear with me as I go through these. Nathair Sihak which is a draconic fey, and is basically the deity of mischief and pranks, which, by the way, most fey subscribe to. They are a little bit prankster-ish and, and often obtuse in their answers. Um, you have Skerret, which is the deity of the centaur races. You have um, uh, Squilach, which is the leprechaun deity of trickery and illusions. And then you also have the fey deity... Um, Veronestra, which um, is the female fairies, deity of beauty and of charm, often the brownies, the dryads, the nymphs, the sylphs, the pixies, the, and the nixies subscribe to her. Keep in mind, all fae, none of them have a real lighthearted aspect. We want to embrace that to them, but they are a tricksterous race of, of beings. Now, there are many different comings about for them. Some people believe that they live in an alternate dimension to ours. 
Others believe they live in a place called the First World. It is something that's purported in Pathfinder, and I believe also in Dungeons & Dragons, that there's a First World of the Fae. It's where um, I know, especially for Pathfinder in the world of Galarian and the Inner Sea Realm settings, that the gnomes come from. And it's why the gnomes have a capricious and, and a little bit of a um, dark sense of humor because they come out of the realm of the Fae, which is always chaotic and shifting. And it's beautiful, but the, the scenery is always on the move and always shifting to something different. It is almost a living chaos. But yet there's an orderly seasonal uh, feel to it. So I guess getting to understand a little bit better, you got to look into the mythology of these things. I suggest before you run a fake campaign, go back and look at the Irish and the, the Germanic, as well as the, uh, so you got the Celtic, the Gaelic, and the Teutonic versions of Fae. Take a look at each, because of each, these different creatures that have been codified in the monster manuals, the bestiaries, the different writings and works come from those three cultures. I'm not saying other cultures like the African culture didn't have Fae. They did. But it is especially exemplified in the very heavy nature cultures and the Druidic cultures, which are the Gales, the Celts, and the Teutons. They really did embrace the aspects of the Fae, and they had a lot of mythology there. And understanding that Fae is a real key thing when you're running a campaign, because otherwise what you're going to do is you're going to kind of butcher it. You have to understand the thinking behind it as a GM. Fae have an odd thinking. They don't think like we do. They think in contracts and what can they get for what they give. And even in what they give, they love to have a little bit of playfulness, so they make it cryptic often. So when you're running a fae like a Nixie or a Sylph or a Dryad, they are not going to be straightforward all the time. They're not going to be forthright with their information. They're not just going to give a good party what they want. They're going to play. They are bored. They are long-lived creatures. They get bored easily. And so they want entertainment. And the mortals are entertainment. Because they're not worried about whether the health of the welfare of the world will be around. They have existed centuries. So they're not caring. All they care about is a little bit of fun in their day. And it's really what goes on. Now, don't get me wrong. Fay love the upper hand. So I think that goes into the second part. Is doing the history... But understanding what a fae is. Fae's, fae creatures are selfish creatures most days. Not all of them, but many of the races are. The centaurs tend to be a little bit more outgoing. Treants can be outgoing, but they're more thoughtful and, and deliberate in their decisions. Fawns have more of a lust for life, as do satyrs and many other creatures that go along with this. Brownies and, and pixies and, Nick, and, and, um, and uh, sprites are much more flighty. They're quick to temper. They are protective of their areas, very territorial. So you really need to understand what drives and motivates these different creatures. Often for at least the, the what I call the courtiers of the Fae, the upper Fae, the higher class fay, the elite fay, they want knowledge. They want the upper hand. They love contracts. And they love when somebody is obligated to them in favors, especially when they sign their own existence over to that fay. It's so one of the things I love about the Dresden Files is it really codifies that when I was reading about the Fey Courts and Harry Dresden and his battle with the Mab, the Maeve, and um, Titania, and all the others. He was in constant conflict of trying not to sign over his whole life, but yet help his friends. And often the Fey had answers. And often the Fey knew it and would play with him because they wanted him under contract. They wanted his abilities and his power. They wanted him as a knight of their court. So they sought him very um, proactively, which Faye can be quite proactive when they want to be. 
if they see an advantage, they're going to go for it. And they do want you indebted to them. That is an aspect of them that they love. And even when you pay it in your own quote-unquote blood, they are still going to be cryptic. In their mind, they're being straightforward, but they're always cryptic. So you have to sort through. So as a GM, when you give answers from a Fae, don't give straight answers. They're not going to do that. They hint around. They play. Now, again, not so much with the Sprite and, and the Pixies. They don't always have to be. And, and the, the other type of fairies, they're a little more timid, straightforward, sometimes very upfront. But most Fae aren't. Most Fae are very tricky tricky and illusory in what they do. So keep that in mind. Now, how do you how do you design the Fae Inn? Do you have them as a simple forest encounter? Do you have them as a water encounter? A mountain encounter? Or are, are the players thrust into their realm? That's up to you as a GM. Keep in mind, the first world is a very weird and unique place. But it is a place of manners and of respect as well. So if a player goes into the Fey realm, keep in mind as a GM, they need to understand that there are codes and things that go on there that the players have to understand. And if they violate them, the Fey court does not give quarter. They will not sit there and say, okay, it's all right that you messed up. Oh, no. You came into their realm. You know their laws whether you know them or not. Is that knowledge readily available? No. No, it's not. And even when it is, it's often very vague because they don't want you to understand their court and their manners. They want you, again, beholden to them. So keep that in mind. Now, Fae are self-preserving. They're not going to necessarily go about putting themselves into a situation where they get obliterated. So when you run them as a GM, even if so, say so. Say you have a winter fay court that's going after your players, like in the uh, reign of winter. They are not going to go whole hog to the point of where they throw their life away. That is not how fay work. They are about trickery, um, unsubtle attacks. That that they're going to hide somewhere in ambush. They're going to do uh, swoop in and swoop out. They're going to try as much as possible not to be brutish. There are some brutish fey, but the majority of them aren't. They are very much about trickery and deception and sneakiness. So they want to use things to their advantage, especially their own realm that they live in. Can the players befriend fey? Of course they can. It depends on the situation. And especially if you save the life or you do something to help a fey, they are then indebted to the players. But even in that, they're going to try to wiggle around what they have to give in return because they don't want to give away an advantage. They, they're they already at a disadvantage in owing a life or owing a favor. So keep that in mind when you're running them. Uh, again, who are my favorites to run and why? And I've run these in Reign of Winter, so I love them. The Red Caps. I love the red caps. This, this description in this book, I think, highlights it. Sadistic fey brutes who harbor slaughter and blasphemy at the core of their terrible hearts. They come out of the English or the, the, the um, Celtic mythos. The red caps are believers that they go into battle, and it's kind of like they're, they're gnome size. They're, they've been likened to gnomes, very sadistic gnomes. They wear metal boots, they have a metal sith, and they also have um, a red cap that they've dipped into their enemies, you know, blood. <laughs> so they're a very bloodthirsty lot, and they usually gang up in a group for disadvantage. You're not going to get one red cap, lone red cap, that goes after a party unless the party's weak. Most times, they're going to gang up, and they're going to ambush and they're going to ambush with severe prejudice. And they're going to come after that party with the idea that they're going to recolor their hat again. So I love them because when it comes to a real face-on battle, I, I like them. And, and they're also a bit tricky in how they handle things. 
they're not the type that that's going to necessarily play fair. They're going to look for advantage. Um, I love the Rusalka. They are a cruel creature that often ha haunt the waterways, and they basically use sorcery and enchantment to draw players in. So they're kind of almost like a siren in some ex aspects. Maybe not with their voice so much, but they're using that type of ability of charm to win the party over and then use them to do their bidding. So the Rusalka can be very, very dangerous, especially in waterborne adventures. Um, I like the Nuckaleave. They are basically the corruption of what is nature. And they have pestilence and corruption throughout them. And they prey on anyone who taint a waterway and poison it. These are the results. They come out of it and they often go with prejudice against those type of creatures because they see them as the poisoners of their perfect realm. They are the guardians, in a sense, of that, uh, of that water. Um, I do love the sprites. I think sprites, especially with class levels in them, and don't be afraid to do that with your monsters. Give them class levels. Now, if your system doesn't have class levels, it has like feats, like kind of like Shadow Run does, where you're building an ability up, or if it is um, just an open ended one, like Open RPG, where you are um, slowly accumulating better feats and skills, then give them that and let them be a little bit more difficult for the party to deal with. Your average sprite is not that hard to, to, to battle or to have oppose you. Sprites don't all have to be good. Some are, some aren't. <laughs> and the way I divide them is the courts. The summer court tends to lean more good. The winter court, because of its cruel and capricious nature, leans evil. And, and just because that winter is cruel, a cruel mistress, and I really go under that aspect, is that they're a much more crueler and bitter group. Um, so any of the type of phase there. I, I do love the, the four Laren. The four Laren are kind of a, um, a mixed bag. If you take a look at them, uh, and some of you are like, well, what, what is a four Laren? Well, if you haven't played a four Laren as a GM, Here's what a Forlairn is. A Forlairn, as described, is a humanoid with the legs of a bald goat and a completely hairless body and a horned head with a sinister um, expression. Basically, it is kind of the crossed offspring between a nymph and a satyr. So they are a hybrid. They have different abilities like heating metal, chilling metal, flaming blade, flaming sphere, gust of wind, summon swarm, and warping wood. So they have some interesting abilities that they can use. Heat metal is their main one they, they tend to use, but you can use some other offshoots of them. They're about a six foot tall creature, 160 pounds, and they live about 100 years, but due to the violent nature of them, they don't live, they're not a long-lived fey creature. They are very violent to normal human beings they don't like. I mean, they're, they're already mad at the fact that they are what they are. So, you know, the, the, the thing there is even more for them. Now, there are some other really cool ones. I like the Holdras. Those are the um, wood or woodwives. The Holdras basically have the form on the outside and the front of a beautiful woman. But you can always tell them because if you look at their back, it's like an open part of a stump or, or a wood uh, uh, that's been tunneled out. So they're a very hollow creature. They have feelings. They care. They're not necessarily malicious. They're malicious when, they, when they've when they lost somebody they've loved or, or someone that they, they were a husband, who was their husband. Then they tend to be a little bit more cruel and capricious. The ones that are seeking their first husband tend to be a little bit more tricksterish just because they want the happiness of being a wife. They don't want the hollowness of their existence. They want to feel alive and real and like a woman. So that is part of their very nature. Um, another one that really is a cool one is the Lurker in the Light. Um, they are a small fae. That they live, lurk on the edge of the illumination. So they're almost kind of like a tooth fairy-ish creature, but different. Um, 
the, the fine features of it always tend to bleed away at the edges and it kind of makes it a little bit blur and if you look into the light it vanishes. So the lurker and the lights are very nasty. They can blend in with light. They have a daylight door that they can dimension door using. They have poison and kind of a ritual gate that, that, a bit, uh, that they can do. They're almost an alien fae in a sense. Um, they're from the plane. Now, the Lurker in the Light basically turns conventional wisdom on its head, for they detest darkness and the creatures that dwell in it, yet themselves are sadistic and evil. They hate the dark creatures and the shadow planes creatures, but yet they're not a good creature. So they're not necessarily going to be good to your party either. And, and, and again, they're about a challenge rating 5, so it means a mid-range challenge for a party. But they're, they're kind of a cool creature in the fact that they can disappear into bright light. And I love that. It, it makes them very hard to really deal with when it comes to dealing with creatures. Now, mind you, I'm looking down at my computer at some of the different ones that I really like. Um, house spirits are fun. That, that's kind of like Baba Yaga's little house spirit that she has. Um, they are a fun type of creature. They're not necessarily evil, but they're, they're, they're a guardian of a house or a home, and a lot of people believed in them in the old days. Um, let's see, who else? Oh, the Sangoy. I like the Sangoys. The Sangoys are another evil fae. And the Sangoys are basically, they're, they're dressed in kind of a tattered finery of an outfit um, and, and an animal for a cloak. Um, it's a gaunt humanoid with long fingers and nails. They're a nasty looking little fae. And um, they can detect a person's thoughts. And, and the really scary stuff is they've got two abilities that are really scary. Yes, the blind sense and hearing somebody's heartbeat to locate them is one thing that makes them tough, but it's not what makes them really killer. They have a curse of misery that they basically can curse a character with basically with a misery if you fail the Sangoy gets a plus two on attack damage rolls saving throws and opposing checks to the character so basically you lose ground with them if if they hit you with the misery but the horrific critical is even worse and they are transparent in sunlight, so they're often hard to see. So they're another just really tricksterish creature that you can bring in and really make a party's life challenging. There's a lot of different fae. The, the great part about the fae is there's over 40 of them, types that are really laid out in both Pathfinder and D&D. Uh, other, you can take and convert these into other systems, so like uh, Open Legend, um, into the Dresden Files, into the Dresden Files actually probably has some of those in their monster things, but you can convert more of these over to that. You can easily take it over to Savage Worlds or the Fate systems real easy, or you can even transfer them to GURPS, and GURPS probably has some of those in the monster books, so the great part is you can use them across the systems. Even in the Vampire of the Requiem, these creatures would be a horrific thing to the vampires because of their very nature and survivability. And in the Dresden Files, they had the Fey Courts at odds with the Vampire Courts. They were not friends at all times. They could be. They made alliances at times, but it wasn't necessarily the case at all times. And because of the nature of the long-livedness of the Fey in many cases, it rivaled the vampires' uh, unnatural life. So there's a lot of cool things that go on with this. A and you can really do a lot to make it enriching. What are some different scenarios? You could have the party calling upon the Fey Court for a favor. You could have, like in Reign of Winter, where, where one of the witches is trying to make an internal perpetual winter of a world. And the, the Unseelie Court loves it. Um, where the Sealy Court does not. <laughs> they are not into a long winter. So you could have the courts join forces with the party and help them out to, to prevent the winter from, from occurring. So there are some things you can do there that really would endear them. Um, you could have a quest to the First World to try to find some really unique magic item that someone wants for their collection. 
there's a lot of different ways you can incorporate the Fae. Don't just have them as a one shot. In fact, an, an adventure path, if you design it or a campaign around the Fae, is really cool. Um, I love this and 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 uh, Kobo Press's Midgard because Zobek itself is centered around Fey. It used to be an area of high Fey, and the fact that the court took a back role once the city became free of the monarchs that ruled it, who were beholden to the Fey, it became a different animal. So now the Fey is trying to gain back that that ground and that trade relationship and and they will offer all kinds of pleasures just to have the life and feel the life of that world again so you can really twist things with Faye I, I love a lot of different things that incorporate them I think they're not used enough near enough and where they are used I think they're underutilized often they're used as just a filler or something you come along in the forest there is so much more there and you don't have to play it to where the players have to kill them necessarily. They can outwit them or try to beat them at riddles or try to gain a favor from them. Always fun things or entrap them. Now remember, you know, cold iron, only thing that affects Fae, really. I mean, magic can affect them, but cold iron really is the, the kryptonite of the Fae. And they hate it. They hate it to no end. So if you bring cold iron around a fey, you already put them in, on edge. They are not happy that you have it and, and that you know about its powers and what it can do. So, again, I call it creativity with the fey. I just think it's an underutilized aspect of gaming, and I think it, it can be such a fun thing for a GM to run because you have so much open play in what you, and how you run a fey, how they react, how they interact with the party, reoccurring roles, how often they show up. They they can gate around through trees and other natural things that the party can won't even suspect sometimes and then you can have them run upon the agents of the fey at different parts of the adventure. And they are very 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 difficult once you make them an enemy to defeat. So keep that in mind. I hope it helps. I, again, I want to do some lighthearted things. I think with all the, the the things that have gone on in the gaming community, and guys, again, I add, I really do ask of you, please put your politics aside. I know candidates may have won that you like or, do, or don't like, but please, we're a community of creativity, wonder, and gaming. Please don't let that taint your view of the community. Please don't polarize it with political views. If you are a writer in a game system or a game company, please don't polarize the gaming world with, with your politics. It just doesn't go well. And please don't just block somebody because they think differently than you. The greatness of our community is we are so unique. We are of different faiths, backgrounds, upbringings, technology, geekiness, um, we are, could be jocks that became geeks, or geeks that are geeks, or techs that are geeks, or but we're a community. We are a unified community in gaming. Please don't destroy that with the poisons of the political world. I'm sorry. I I believe po politics are necessary in life, but they are the most unstabilizing, poisonous thing in, in around. I just truly believe that. And I truly believe that no good comes from the divisions in them. Uh, we will be divided and at odds at times because they're of differing of beliefs. But don't let it go into your system and poison your friendships and, and cause you to lose good people out of your life. I really think we need to be more uplifting, positive, giving. And, and I know I put that in all my videos, but I really believe it's true. And I've seen a lot of the hate on Twitter and on Facebook, and guys, it's got to end. It really does. I know you're afraid, but you got to get past the fears and see that the community is a good place for the most part. Yes, there are incidents where they are bad and they should be called out and dealt with, but otherwise, it's a great community and a very unique one. Thanks again, and I hope you have a great week.